Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Schoenix. Uh, Mark is a full professor in the Department of Psychology, and he's the head of the uh, Language, Reading, and Cognitive Neuroscience Lab there. Um, Mark uh, has uh, Mark does research on language development and reading in children and adults, uh, and he's been involved in our faculty recently and uh, over the past several years in a number of different ways. He's talked to our pre-service students, um, he's participated in helping supervise our grad students, and most recently, Mark was on the search committee for our Tier 2 uh, Canada Research Chair in Neuroscience and Learning Disorders. Uh, so we're pleased to welcome Mark uh, for his talk today, and I'll turn things over to you. Thanks very much, Gary. Uh, so yeah, like, like Gary said, I was here. Um, we were locked in this room for basically two weeks. They gave us little sleeping bags. And uh, people would come in and give talks and stand right here. And I thought, oh, those poor bastards. So here I am. Uh, so it's really nice to be here. And uh, so I'm going to talk about some of the research my lab's been doing maybe over the last uh, seven or eight years looking at reading in the brain. This is part of a bigger whole where we're uh, using neuroimaging to uh, shed some light on cognitive phenomena. And uh, here I've made it fairly imaging heavy in the sense that I felt like that's probably the, the stuff that would be news to you folks. We also do a lot of behavioral stuff as well. I don't think we're a pure imaging lab by any stretch. Uh, so I'm going to focus in on reading ability here today. I do also work on things like individual differences and second language learning in adults and things like age of acquisition effects and a variety of other kinds of things as well. Here are just uh, a, a, an advertisement for the reading research that we're doing first initially with adults and then uh, in the second half of the talk looking at kids as well. So. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about reading from the standpoint of someone like me who started off actually as a linguist is that we're always told about how learning to talk is this effortless implicit task that little babies do and that in general this is not something that's heavily controlled and one way you describe it is it's kind of deceptively easy for them to do. Uh, reading is different in the sense that it's hard. Uh, children learn to read very, very slowly over the course of many years. If you think about it from a biological standpoint, um, humans didn't really evolve to read, right? So reading is from uh, a biological standpoint a very, very new cultural innovation that gets smacked up on top of something that exists already, which is this human brain that probably has some sort of, maybe I'll say innate or at least genetically predisposed systems that are already built into it. And so reading is actually a different enough kind of system that it's going to look different in the brain compared to speech. Uh, another way to think about that is some people never learn to read. There are all kinds of cultures out there that are not literate. Only in the last hundred years has it become the human norm for literacy to be present in an individual, right? Prior to that point, it was really just the purview of uh, the clerical class or uh, for the very wealthy, for the very educated, and most people were not literate. That's changed very rapidly over the last century and a half. I wonder if this remote will work. Sure. Uh, if we think about what the cognitive systems are involved in learning to read, um, you take a word like professor here that we're actually visually perceiving, and the general impression that people have is what you're doing is you're translating that visual word into some sort of image in your head of what a professor is, right? So it's this guy. Um, and, you know, everybody's concept of what it's going to be is going to be different. But in general, when you see this word, you get some sort of conceptual semantic level thing that pops up in your head. But, of course, we probably think that there's another piece to this, too, which is that there's a sound of the word professor, right? That the word itself is made up of phonemes. And before we learned to read this word, we learned what these phonemes are and how those work. So really, initially, the language system was just these two bits. When you learn to read, you're smacking this other piece onto it. You get also, though, probably some amount of interplay within this more linguistic conceptual system where the sound professor is allowing you to understand the meaning of the word. So you could imagine reading through a single root in which you are translating these letters on a page into these sounds, and then these sounds then allow you to access the meaning. That's one way. Or you could think about it the other way, too, right? Where you, oops, where you, uh, did that not happen? I thought there was an animation there. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, where you could be uh, mapping in the other direction as well. Okay. Um, now, 
where that brings us then is this debate about what's going on when we're reading, whether we're recognizing words holistically by taking the entire word and thinking about its meaning versus, uh, which we may call a whole word approach or a holistic or a direct root approach versus something where we're uh, mapping these individual letters or graphemes, which are assemblies of letters or other kinds of visual symbols, depending on which reading system you're dealing with, onto the phonemes in your head which uh, would be in English something like taking the SH and, sh and shoot, I think, well, that's the SH sound, and the OO sound here is the do double O, and then the T makes the T phoneme, and that there's some sort of relationship between these two. And people have called this various names, things like decomposition, phonics, the sublexical root, and so on. Uh, why do we think that phonology matters? That is, why do we think that the spoken word code matters? Well, a lot of the research in my lab that I'll be talking about really focuses on the idea that reading is fundamentally a phonological process as much as it's a visual process. It's not just seeing the words on the page, but it's also thinking about the phonemes in your head. Uh, and one way to think about that is that if you're trying to figure out what letter goes with the sound B, uh, you can't help but notice that when you look at words that start with B, they all tend to have the same B sound at the start, right? So we have black, break, bone, and book. And that words that end in the B letter also end in the B sound, Robin club. And even in the middle of the word, that B is helping you figure out ability, stable, ambulance. So there is some sort of mapping between these two codes. Now, admittedly, it varies across languages how many exceptions you're going to get. And in English, for instance, the last B in the letter bomb is silent, so you've got to learn to ignore that case. But even in those cases, I would I would characterize it as a quasi-regular problem where getting, you know, letter sound correspondences may get you 80%, 90% of the way there. It buys you a lot of information, even in individual words. So for instance, take an exceptional word like bomb that ends in the letter B, but you don't pronounce B. You know, the pronunciation of bomb is not, you know, blicket. Right? It's not an arbitrary relationship between letters and sounds. Even in those exceptional cases, the exceptions occur at a very local, finer grain part of the word rather than the word itself. It's very unusual to get a word that doesn't sound anything like how it's spelled. Even words like kernel and yacht tend to be somewhat like the letters that make them up. And of course, those are standouts in the sense that those represent one corner of the space of the problem that you're learning. Most of the words have a lot of regularity in it in terms of mapping spelling and sound. So it's probably really important. Um, so this idea of decoding then is taking the phonemes in your head and mapping those letters that you see. And that um, the argument is that this is a lot of reading. And um, so for instance, as I said before, you've got these graphemes and you're mapping them onto phonemes. This is called a lot of things in different kinds of areas of research, right? It can be called decomposition and decoding, depending on when we're thinking about it in terms of adults reading in a laboratory. Often we call it decomposition. We'll call it decoding sometimes when we're talking about how kids learn to read. There's the idea of phonics, which is sort of an instructional approach that involves emphasizing letter sound correspondences. And then there's things like we can call it the sublexical root when we're thinking about a neurocognitive model of how we read. So if the term sublexical root doesn't make any sense to you, join the club. But there's this idea that there are different kinds of models of how the lexicon work. And the sublexical root is the idea that you're ignoring lexical or word-based information and instead decoding or decomposing. Um, the other piece, though, is like, is this what skilled readers do, or is this just, you know, somebody who studies kids reading, right? So when you ask somebody how do you read, they'll often uh, profess to not really do any kind of phonological sublexical decoding, right? What they'll say is, now that I'm a skilled reader and I'm a big person, I will now look at the whole word and recognize that word for what it is, which is just that whole word. Um, the reason why I think that's wrong is uh, is many fold here. One piece of it is that we encounter new words all the time, right? So we get these new words like Furby, Internet, Google, Blogosphere. You can tell these slides are a little bit older than, right? <laughs> uh, or, 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 you know, you find out this is person named Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch, right? So there are all these, these funny new words that come along. And how do you know what they sound like when you see it initially? Well, it's because you've got a process of analogy to what you already know in terms of how the letters on the page map into the sounds of the words. There's also considerable ev evidence, though, from a psycholinguistic standpoint, that adults are using phonology in an active fashion when they read connected texts. And this is from things like uh, priming studies, where you flash words right before people read the word and show that the phonological relationship of a prime to the target that you're naming actually can influence by a few milliseconds how quickly you can read that target. 
Um, things like eye tracking studies where your eye movements to words is being influenced by decoding processes and by the phonological typicality of a word, for instance. Uh, and then neuroimaging studies, as I'll show in a few minutes, where you can show that regions of the brain that we think are phonological in nature are very actively engaged when you're reading words, even when you're not necessarily reading for sound, you're just reading text. Uh, these effects are rapid and, are, and unconscious, and in such, and as a result of that, people will swear up and down that they're not decoding, right? And and part of that is people are lousy at introspection. Uh, mm -hmm. The effects are very rapid and probably very implicit. The other thing, though, is uh, what was the other thing that uh, that people think about decoding often as like people who move their lips when they read, right? They're not thinking about decoding as actually what could be a very easy, rapid process in adults. They think about it as still a very slow process of looking at each letter in turn and thinking about the sound that the letter makes, when in fact phonological activation can be very rapid and automatic. And that's part of reading development is developing automatization. Developing automatization in reading doesn't necessarily mean that you stop using phonology. It just means you become very effortless in your engagement of that phonological code. So with regard to learning to read then, uh, there are different techniques out there that have emphasized different ways of thinking about reading. Um, and certainly a lot of them these days emphasize the idea of decoding and phonics, the idea that you should be teaching kids to sound it out this comes off as old fashioned and slow, and it's kind of the way we've always been teaching reading more or less, and uh, it kids don't like it, right? Because you're forcing them to read fairly simple words in books that are kind of dull. Uh, making it interesting is, is a challenge from a pedagogical standpoint because it's a lot of like, you know, this week we're working on this doublet or this triplet of letters and the sounds that they make in the context of certain words. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean, that means you're not always reading about Ninja Turtles, right? You're reading about things that are boring like Dick and Jane, and um, that's not always super appealing. Um, along comes this idea of whole language, right? Which is sort of the idea that you should just teach kids the actual words and think about it as, you know, teaching kids the way that we've introspectively thought adults learn spoken language, which is by learning whole words and by doing it in an implicit fashion rather than teaching them in an explicit way, uh, which was pitched, especially in the 1980s, as a fun and new science-based approach where we're focusing on word learning and de-emphasizing spelling sound rules, which led to this uh, whole language debate, uh, right? where instead of the phonics where you're de decomposing the word instead, what you're doing is cutting out the middleman. You're saying, teach kids to read the way that we think adults read. Um, the issue is that experiments that have gone whole hog into whole language, that have de-emphasized phonics to the point where it's a couple of hours over an, an entire school year of instruction or less, have tended to be disasters in the sense that we've seen reading scores dip down quite significantly. And I think the proof is in the pudding that when school boards, for instance, in Ontario, move back to a phonics-based approach sometime around 2001, 2002, what we've seen is the opposite effect, where actually the average reading scores that we see in kids in second or third grade are much higher than the normative tables that we're using to assess it. So you assess a whole bunch of kids using standardized tests developed in the 90s, and these kids are up to a standard deviation better readers than the normative sample that these original tests were normed on. So we've actually had to go back and renorm some of our standardized tests because kids are doing really well. There's not really a crisis in reading right now, and part of that, at least in Ontario, and part of that is because most kids who've been taught using a phonics-based approach where there's a lot of phonological awareness pre-training are probably doing just fine, at least at that single word reading stage. The crisis probably has to do more with that bottom 10 to 15 percent who have some sort of learning impairment, rather than the idea that on average kids are lousy readers. Uh, our experience in our lab, and I don't have slides for this, but is, is that in general, if you want to find the thing that kids in schools are bad at these days, you should be focusing on math, not on reading. Um, Stan DeHaan has suggested uh, that, in fact, reading instruction should be very heavy phonolo heavily phonological and that there are these poor compromises out there, like a mixed approach or a balanced approach or reading recovery, where, uh, you know, different kids are given different levels of whole language instruction based on their level of reading already and that you do get little bits of phonics. Uh, he's quite wary of it and I think part of that may be from uh, the standpoint where he's coming from. I do think there's a balanced approach that makes sense but that it has to have phonics at a fundamental level early on where reading comprehension is emphasized later on. And later on I'll talk about uh, some of the stuff we're doing in that regard. Um, 
but an interesting example of this is is kids come home with worksheets all the time. Uh, again, this is from Stanislas de Haan, it's not from me, uh, but uh, these worksheets, here's a worksheet that's supposed to be a reading worksheet where what you're doing is you're teaching kids associate the, you know, the image of a concept like tree with the word on the page. And so they're just circling the right word that goes with this. And, uh, you know, this poor kid here is circled pink instead of cat, uh, maybe because it's a lousy drawing of cat. Again, that's not really a useful way to spend your kid's time when you're teaching them how to read. Uh, I think this is probably even worse. So here it's a challenge of understanding the shape of the word. So we've got uh, ascenders and descenders. And so by the example here, we have uh, something that has neither an ascender or a descender, like the letter A, two Ps that have only descenders, and an ascender like L, right? So kids are being taught to recognize the shape of the word rather than the sound of the word or the, even the meaning of the word, which again, I think it comes from a good place of the idea that you're trying to get kids to recognize the whole word all at once. Uh, you know, the craziness of this one, of course, is that here the kids actually got it right and the teacher's gone and scored them wrong for it. So I, it's not a useful way to emphasize how reading works, right? It's, it's not emphasizing the right part and the part that actually is hard. Teach the thing that's hard, not what the shape of the letter is, but what the sounds those letters make. Another way to think about it is, well, what's happening in your brain when you're reading? And if we uh, look at, this is just data that I've pulled off of one study that we've run with adults where you get people to read for sound versus read for meaning. And when you get people to read for sound versus meaning, slightly different parts of the left hemisphere tend to be more active than if you just get them to stare blankly or, or sorry, make a visual judgment about a bunch of uh, meaningless letters on a page. So that's the subtraction that I'm not showing here. But what we see is that there are parts of the brain that are lighting up for reading for sound, that's what's in yellow, parts of the brain that are lighting up for reading and meaning. And we've also got regions that overlap with each other that are showing up here in orange, right, that are really activated for both. So both of those things are probably happening in the brain while people are reading even single words. And I'll, in a few minutes, I'll break this down and actually look at what this all means and what this can tell us about reading skill. Uh, again, Stan Dehan, I'm not the first person to discover this, right? This is not news to anybody. Uh, Stanislas Dehan has uh, a very nice figure where he lays this out. So this is the cumulative result of dozens and dozens of fMRI and PET studies over the past two decades of reading, where you can think about uh, reading as a network of brain regions that starts off with pure visual inputs in the occipital lobe, which doesn't really care what those visual inputs are. What it's doing is breaking it down into visual features. Uh, a part of the inferior temporal lobe that seems to be sensitive specifically to visual shapes of words, right? That seems to be excited with visual words and not excited at all by other kinds of visual information like faces, or at least to a lesser extent. And that information from that point on gets passed on to what we might call two pathways. One is a meaning-based pathway that thinks about what the meaning of the word is, and the other is a phonology-based pathway that thinks about what the pronunciation of the word is. This is grossly oversimplified, and you'll notice that I've not made any of these circles overlap with each other. Again, as a massive oversimplification, it's probably much, much less easy to tease those two things apart, and there's probably more regions that these pathways have in common than they have separately. But there's lots of nice evidence that, in fact, these pathways do work and interact with each other. And so I've added some extra arrows here that are these gray arrows, just to remind myself to say these two pathways tend to interact at every level so that they're always talking to each other. So even if you're telling the subject in an fMRI study, tell me if this word rhymes with cat or not, uh, you're probably also seeing regions light up that are sensitive to the meaning of the word, not just to the sound of the word. So uh, how can we take that kind of basic science and find out interesting things about what's going on when people are reading? So from here on in, I'm going to stop preaching about teaching kids to read and think more about just breaking down this reading network and how you can study it in interesting ways using uh, the kinds of neuroimaging tools that are available to us, for instance, right here at Western. The challenge to a lot of this is that a lot of what we know about this reading network comes from averaging across a bunch of adults. So people recruit. Uh, their convenience sample, what we'll call normal adults, which turn out to be undergrads and grad students who are looking to make 40 bucks, and get them to read words in the scanner under different circumstances. Maybe it's uh, reading regular words or exception words, or words or non-words, or reading sentences of one kind or another. And what we see here is that when you manipulate the stimuli or the tasks, different parts of this reading network tend to activate more or less. And that tells you something about what the structure of the reading network is. 
which sounds dandy, except that, you know, how normal are your undergrads and your, uh, and your grad students, right? These are hyper-literate individuals where pretty much what you're sending them home to do outside of class is read. They do a lot of reading on their own for pleasure. These people are really good readers. And so how do we know that the structure of this reading network is really this unified thing? Often it's a convenient sample. Or else it's even in kids' studies, it's children of people who would bring their kid to Western to get their brain scanned, <laughs> which means that you're either your child is doing really, really well or really, really badly. So um, how much normal variability is there in this reading network? A uh, postdoctoral fellow in my lab from a few years ago named Suzanne Welcome uh, set out to look at this in an adult sample that was anything but a convenient sample. We actually recruited exclusively from off campus. It was part of a bigger study where we were looking at twins. We never got enough twins to really look at the twin piece of it, but what we had was a very large sample of people who responded solely on the basis that they happened to have a twin. And so it got us actually quite an interesting cross-section of the population. Uh, in terms of age and reading ability and every other socioeconomic piece of information that you want to know varied in a really broad and interesting way. So some people were from campus, you know, who saw the ad around. Other people, these were just folks off the street who were looking to make some money. Um, and what we did was we tested them behaviorally outside of the scanner and looked at individual differences on reading ability and other things that we'll call sub-processes of reading. So we measured aspects of their decoding by giving them non nonsense words to read versus familiar words. We also gave them lots of uh, reading comprehension tests, IQ tests, a whole variety of things. And then we lined it up with uh, measures of cortical brain activation, that is functional MRI, and also white matter connectivity, which is diffusion tensor imaging. So I'll talk about what diffusion tensor imaging is in just a sec. Uh, first, I'll talk about functional MRI. I think I'm probably telling people what they already know here, but um, the difference between an MRI scan and a functional MRI scan is that with an MRI scan, you get a static, static image of a person's anatomy, but it doesn't really tell you what each of those uh, parts of the anatomy is actually doing at any given point in time. It's just one big image. Uh, a functional MRI is actually a moving image. It's almost like the way that we would make a movie, right? You take a photograph and then another one and another one, and over time you get a moving image of things changing over time. So during a functional MRI session, you take one brain scan about once every one or two seconds while individuals are performing cognitive activities, and then you look at the rise and fall of blood, oxygen, blood oxygenation in the different parts of the brain that you're imaging and try to tie that with the behavioral tasks that you're presenting to the individual as they're lying there in the scanner. Uh, to give you a sense of our subjects here, this is looking at 20 adult subjects between 19 and 59 years old with a whole range of education from grade 12 all the way through university. Uh, we measured a few different reading measures, for instance, here that I'll give you, as well as nonverbal intelligence. So nonverbal intelligence ranged from 72 to 140. So a really big range of that. Uh, reading ability ranged from below average to, you know, to above average. And then things like Nelson Denny reading comprehension. Again, people who are very good versus very poor comprehenders. So if you're interested in variability, you want lots of variance. And we did manage to get lots of variance from these individuals, which really helped us along the way. We gave them all a reading task in which they saw the same stimuli on each part of the reading task, but we varied the instructions. So what we were doing was we had them look at pairs of words on a computer screen as they're lying in the scanner, and they had to do either a visual task where they're simply telling us, is this the same case pattern? So this was tricky, but what we say is some of them are uppercase and some of them are lowercase, and is the pattern of upper lowercase here in the two words the same? So here you would say yes. So the idea there is, don't think about the words, just look at the visual form of the word, versus getting them to measure, getting them to focus on the sound of the word. So for instance, they see comb and roam and they know that those rhyme. Interestingly, we gave them different spelling patterns to really force them to think about the sound of the word, not just look at the visual form of the word. And then the last piece would be thinking about the name, of the, thinking about the semantics. So is one of these an animal? name. So but in, in this case, again, they had to read both words, but ignoring the sound of those words, are they, is one of these the name of an animal? So that again is an active semantic processing task. When you get them to read for sound, you get uh, a bunch of brain regions that activate to different degrees compared to this visual baseline and just judging what the visual form of the word is. 
uh, when he gets people to read for meaning, you get a slightly different constellation of left hemisphere regions and also quite a bit of right hemisphere regions in the parietal and frontal lobe that have to do with thinking about the meanings of the words rather than just the phonological or visual forms of the words. That's interesting as a group and it recapitulates what we kind of already know, right? That different kinds of reading are going to activate this reading network to different extents. The other thing we can do, though, is thinking about this from the standpoint of a regression model where we might think about how a behavioral measure that's obtained outside of the scanner predicts brain activity in any of these different brain regions when we pull out the effect of other kinds of things. So here's, uh, oops, here's the non-word reading test on the y-axis here. Uh, and these are, so these are voxels here lit up in yellow that respect a correlation between non-word reading and the fMRI signal intensity so that you get greater, in, greater fMRI signal presumably due to more cognitive processing in these kinds of regions in response to, uh, as a function of how good of a non-word reader that person is during this reading task. Um, so this is in the middle temporal gyrus, which we think is related to things like letter sound, correspondence, and decoding. Um, we also find an interesting inverse relationship when we look at Nelson-Denny comprehension, where people who engage more of their superior temporal gyrus, which is heavily phonological, actually show an inverse relationship where they show less brain activity the poorer they are at, at um, comprehension, at reading comprehension. So there it's actually the opposite kind of effect, where you're using this region more, sorry, you're using this region less, the better of a comprehender you are, the more you're engaging comprehension level processing. So there's different ways of breaking apart this brain region, these sets of brain regions and understanding their function, and also understanding that the amount to which you're actually engaging this brain region is going to vary depending on who you are, what kind of reader you are whether you're a reader who engages more phonological kind of processes versus one who's engaging more of a uh, whole word set of processes, and it's not the same regions, right? That there's probably different regions that are working in concert with each other to give rise to this entire thing that we call reading. Another way of getting at that is neuroanatomically by looking at white matter tractography. So with something called diffusion tensor imaging, we can take another static image of the brain where we look at water diffusion in different parts of the brain to look to give us a, key, a clue as to what the white matter coherence is in the different white matter tracts of the brain. So this is a very fancy image. You may have seen this before uh, where you are taking a DTI image and based on some fancy math, you can then figure out where the different white matter tracts are in the brain and where they're leading to. So it gives you a map of connectivity in the brain that's a static map. Um, and uh, that connectivity map is, uh, is based on the principle that water in the brain will diffuse in different directions to different amounts based on the presence of myelin. So myelin is there in white matter uh, in a directional fashion so that you get more directional myelin in some parts of the brain where the white matter is, uh, is, is um, more anisotropic, basically as more coherent. And then in other parts of the brain, like in cerebrospinal fluid, there's diffusion in every possible direction because it's just like water in a glass. It's not diffusing in any specific direction. So that allows you to test not just the presence or absence of myelin, but also the degree of myelination. And that degree of myelination is useful because it gives you a hint as to how efficient those different neural channels are. So we come up with different kinds of images to look at this. Here what we're doing is we can take superior temporal gyrus, which we know is important to phonological decoding and also spoken word processing. And we simply use that as a seed region. Then we say, where are the white matter tracks coming out of that left STG going to and how coherent are they? So this is just a probabilistic map of where those tracts are leading to. And I'm just showing you different slices through the brain as a three-dimensional image. That's as a group. Now, the other thing, though, is what about individual differences? Do people vary in how much connectivity they have from this auditory brain region to other parts of the brain? For instance, connecting the left and the right hemisphere or connecting uh, left hemisphere or superior temporal gyrus regions with, for instance, visual regions and frontal regions. Those seem to be important connections for processing written and spoken language. And indeed, you can uh, use a correlation or a regression model to look at this. So we can take uh, the volume of this hypothetical white matter tract in each individual, which we're estimating subject-wise. And here we've pulled out uh, 
two separate subjects just to show that for illustrative purposes. But we've done it for each subject separately, and then we correlate that against their uh, their decoding score from the Tower test. So that's their ability to read onwards. And we find that there is, in fact, a significant relationship between the size of that tract, which is just an indirect measure of the coherence of white matter leading from this auditory brain region, and their nonward reading ability. Uh, so somebody who's a very good nonward reader over here in the distribution shows uh, a lot of connectivity both from left and right hemispheres talking to each other and also in the anterior and posterior direction. Yeah? Can you just remind me what nonword reading is? So nonword reading uh, in this case is reading not pronounceable nonsense words in isolation. Okay, so uh, what would be measured by the word attack test on the Woodcock-Johnson? In this case, it's the PDE test of the tower test, where it's a speeded task where you get a card full of these nonsense words from one to three syllables long and read them as quickly as you can. So there does seem to be some way of relating the uh, white matter anatomy facts with people's uh, nonsense word reading ability. Uh, not shown here are other correlations that show similar correlations for different white matter tracts for things like uh, reading comprehension and IQ. So uh, if you're interested in that, I'm happy to send you the paper. But uh, basically, there are different tracts that do different things and are related to reading in really interesting principled ways. Um, so the brain's reading network is being modulated then by individual differences in these reading subskills. And uh, there are trading relationships between semantics and phonology that are important to bear in mind when we think about this, that the same tracts or the same brain regions are not going to be important for just phonology as for semantics or for things like IQ even, that there are different regions and different white matter tracts that are all participating in interesting independent waves. Uh, so successful reading doesn't hinge on any one brain pathway or any one brain region. Rather, it's going to hinge on a whole bunch of different things working together, probably in non-obvious ways. Where we've gone to next with this is to look at cases of kids with developmental dyslexia uh, compared to their typical reading peers. So developmental dyslexia is an interesting case where these are kids who failed to learn how to read. So the general definition of dyslexia here is it's a deficit in reading that's not caused by a more fundamental impairment. And uh, so it's slow and laborious reading with lots of errors, right? So reading the wrong word and uh, yet normal cognitive achievement. So we're moving more and more away from this uh, exclusivity view here where we're thinking about it as a dissociation between cognitive achievement and reading. But these kids are generally thought to have, you know, not a lot else wrong with them. Uh, certainly they don't, uh, they don't have pervasive developmental disorders or broader kinds of language disorders. Otherwise, we would categorize them into a broader category like AST or developmental language impairment. Um, a key thing here when I'm talking to the lay public is to emphasize that this has nothing to do with reversing letters or seeing words upside down and so on, right? Um, so for instance, um, my daughter Marianne here, when she was three, this was her writing her name with sidewalk chalk on the sidewalk. She's written it perfectly well, except that she's written it backwards. She's forgotten which way A goes. Uh, the R is correct, on the other hand, um, and E is going the right way. And literally the same day she brought home some uh, a worksheet from school, again, they love the worksheets, where she wrote her name perfectly well from left to right. And I hasten to point out she got an A on the worksheet for, <laughs> color, for coloring in the clown. Uh, so anyway, uh, all that to say, kids constantly reverse letters, right? And part of normal development is letter reversal. And the issue with uh, people thinking about dyslexia as reading backwards and seeing backwards is in part because people keep repeating these sort of neuromyths about dyslexia being a visual impairment. It's not a visual impairment. What's causing dyslexia probably has more to do with phonological processing. There are various hypotheses out there. Some of them are more general than this and talk about auditory processing or sensory abilities or perceptual abilities. Others are much, much more specific, having to do with really there being a phonological decoding or a phonological um, phonological letter sound association mechanism that's impaired. They all focus around this idea, though, that they're having difficulty associating letters on a, letters on a page with the sounds in their heads, either because there's something wrong with the sounds in their heads or there's something wrong with their ability to access those auditory representations from a visual representation. One thing that we can measure here is their spoken language and find that their processing of spoken language could be impaired in, in subtle but 
measurable ways. So, for instance, phonological awareness deficits um, probably most famously are related to dyslexia, where a phonological awareness deficit is, for instance, asking a child to do phoneme deletion, like say split without the puh, and split without the puh is slit. And so uh, what you did there was you took those sounds in your head for split and broke them down, broke, it, broke split into each individual phoneme, took out that puh phoneme, stuck it all back together. So you're doing this manipulation of the sounds of the words in a, in a way that requires you to think about the sounds, right? And kids with dyslexia find that enormously difficult. Kids in kindergarten find that quite difficult as well, but actually you can find that kids who are really poor at that at the pre-reading stage go on to be poor readers later on in life. It's one of the good predictors of subsequent reading ability because it's so foundational to learning to read, right? Knowing that uh, that the B in able makes the letter B on the page involves knowing that able in your head is not just one sound, it's a bunch of individual phonemes that you can break apart. Um, another easier one is rhyming ability. We take that for granted, but again, kindergartners, not all kindergartners are perfect at, ra at, at rhyming. You can ask them if sandal and candle rhyme versus candle and candy, which sound alike but don't rhyme. Uh, your ability to do a rhyme judgment in kindergarten, again, is very closely related to how you subsequently end up reading. Uh, work by Peter Bryant in the 1980s established this quite nicely and even showed that IQ is nowhere close to being as good a predictor of reading success as these sorts of phoneme-based tasks. And we know why phon phonology matters if you've been paying attention here, right? That uh, there's a phonological representation in your head that needs to get paired up to the visual form of the words on the page. A problem with phonology in your head prior to learning to read can lead to difficulty learning these spelling sound correspondences, these regularities. So for instance, problems in particular with reading nonsense words. Even in adult dyslexic readers who've compensated through a whole word kind of process, um, right, so who've, who've uh, compensated by reading via this direct route from spelling to meaning still have a problem with reading non-words typically and show slow visual word recognition even though uh, they've, they've been remediated to a certain extent. So phonology does seem to matter for developmental dyslexia. Uh, in our lab, uh, a few years back, we studied, we did an fMRI study where we looked at typical readers versus kids with dyslexia. These were kids who were referred to us from the Scottish Rite Learning Center, which offers uh, tutoring using the Orton-Gillingham approach and uh, they paired up with us and actually gave us some funding as well to, to look at these kids. And in uh, two groups of kids, typical readers versus kids with dyslexia, what we decided to do was not give them a reading task in the scan, but instead give them a phonological processing task. That is, got them to listen to words and make judgments about those words while they're lying in the scanner. So what we did was we showed them a picture on the screen in the MRI scanner and then through a special set of fMRI compatible headphones, they heard a word and we're simply matching the word to the word on the page. We made it a little bit tricky by making the word sometimes a near miss to the actual picture. So they would see, uh, for instance, lock and they would hear rock, rock and lock rhyme with each other and you get these interesting interference effects. Uh, Typical readers here, we look at the right hemisphere. I'm not showing the left hemisphere. Both kids use a lot of their left hemisphere to do this task. The interesting distinction seemed to happen when we looked at dyslexic kids versus um, typical readers. And what we found was that the kids with reading problems used a lot more right hemisphere activation to detect these, uh, these phonological miscues, these, these cases where the word didn't quite match what their expectation was. And when you do a statistical contrast of those two, what you find is in fact that uh, the reading impaired kids show more right hemisphere activation in this temporal brain region, and in fact less activation in this frontal brain region in the right hemisphere. Uh, what we're suggesting here is it's an over-reliance on this right hemisphere for doing something that mo in most cases only requires left hemisphere language regions in typical kids. But in dyslexic kids, we see this clear neural marker of processing difficulty in the right hemisphere. Uh, so our suggestion here is that you can see differences in how words are processed in these kids. All kids found this task relatively easy. Accuracy was quite high. Kids with dyslexia were a little bit on the slower side compared to the typically developing kids. But in general, uh, you couldn't see behaviorally that they were really finding this task difficult, but you're seeing clear neural markers that things were not quite right 
when you look at their brain activation on this task. One challenge of any kind of fMRI study, though, is that what you're tracking is behavioral tasks. You have to decide on a behavioral task to give the child before you put them in the scanner, and then you have them do this behavioral task. Um, early on, we looked at uh, kids with reading problems, right? And so what would you do with kids with reading problems? Well, make them read in the scanner. But these kids are terrible at reading, right? By definition, they have a great deal of difficulty reading. So why would you be surprised if a behavioral, if a behavioral difference was not also reflected in the brain differences as well, right? Um, it would be nice if you could just put somebody in an MRI scanner and just get them to lie there for a little while and just take an image of their brain or take a few images of their brain and, f and then, you know, say, here's where the parts of their brain that are activating when they're just lying there thinking are different from control kits. Because then you're not blaming it on the task. Then what you're saying is, this is just where their brains are different from typically developing kits. And in fact, you can do that. Um, so we call it resting state fMRI. So resting state fMRI involves lying still on the scanner for you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes while we take an fMRI scan of your brain, but there's no task. So individuals are simply being asked to lie there alert, awake. Um, usually they stare at a fixation cross. Some studies they have them shut their eyes. The problem with them shutting their eyes is that some subjects are so relaxed that they just fall asleep. <laughs> uh, and your brain is always doing something. Right? So you're not going to get a brain map of no activation. What you'll get is a brain map of oscillatory brain activity in all these different brain regions. And what you can actually see is that the, uh, the rise and fall of brain activity over the course of, say, five minutes of fMRI scanning can correlate with the uh, activation in other parts of the brain. So if we take, for instance, uh, brain regions A and B, what we see is that brain regions A and B show potentially correlated activation patterns. The argument there is there's functional connectivity there, that the function of one brain region is actually linked to the function of another brain region, probably in an undirected way, okay? So it's undirected in the sense that we're not going to make any claims about the causation of this brain region causing this brain region to be active, at least not in this study. Some people use fancier math to make causal claims. Uh, I have my doubts. And what you see is that different connections are going to be positive or negative, reflecting this correlation in the time course from one brain region to the next. So for instance, brain region A here, hypothetically, is not going to be seen as functionally connected to brain region C because there's no correlation in these signal levels with these signal levels. So this seems like pretty interesting news because it would allow us to put kids in the scanner without having to come up with a task and without having to worry that maybe if we didn't find a difference that it was that it was just because we chose the wrong task, right? The nightmare scenario is paying thousands of dollars to scan all these kids and then you use a task that doesn't really show a difference between groups. So here, what we did was, uh, these are 58 kids so far. This is an ongoing study, but this is the, the data from the first year of this where we got 58 children from London, uh, their ages 8 to 11 years old, and uh, there's a good balance between male and female. We've got some left-handers and some right-handers in there. So as a matter of policy, we don't exclude left-handers because it turns out that left-handers read as well. And uh, so we're, we're doing about 30 minutes of fMRI and MRI scanning. So they spend about 30 minutes in the scanner. Uh, they're doing resting state fMRI. That's what RS fMRI is. They do about five minutes of that. They do about... Uh, five minutes of a diffusion tensor imaging scan that I'm not going to show you the data from today. And they also do just a straight up T1 anatomical scan, which again takes five minutes. The other 15 minutes involves uh, physicists fiddling around on a computer while the kid lies there watching a movie. Uh, it turns out you spend a lot of time and pay a lot of money for physicists to like do things on a computer console and you just have to let them, you have to leave them alone. So uh, this was in and out fairly quickly so that movement was not a big concern. We had kids come into our lab ahead of time where we have a mock scanner that kind of looks like a big barbecue actually and they kind of get rolled back into this mock scanner and practice lying really still and get feedback on their ability to lie really still using different kinds of apparatus. And in doing this, this pre-training actually really eliminates the need to throw out subjects later on where kids are moving around too much. It also helps that we're running kids between 8 and 11. Any younger than 8, it gets a little more dodgy. And 6-year-olds are just a bit more nightmarish. You end up throwing out way a lot of data. You want to run either like really, really young babies that can sleep through the whole thing or wait until they're 7 before you start scanning them. Anything in between there becomes much more challenging and you end up spending a lot more money scanning kids who ultimately move too much.
any kind of movement is like in those old timey photographs where it took like 30 minutes to expose the photo and if you moved it all the picture was blurry it's that same kind of thing it's the same principle which is that you're taking a photograph where the thing that you're imaging has to stay perfectly still for the whole duration or else you're not going to be able to figure out where that point is in space over time um, outside the scanner, we ran a battery of behavioral test that includes some reading tests, so word reading, nonsense word reading, reading comprehension. Uh, we ran several math tests, some nonverbal IQ measures, other things like rapid naming that I won't talk about today. Um, I'll point out that about 14 of these kids meet the criteria, stricter criteria for dyslexia, so below the 10th percentile. A bunch of them are kind of middling poor readers, and then the rest are just typical readers that we've recruited through other means as part of a bigger pool of uh, participants that we have here at Western. Um, importantly though, we focused on the ability as a continuum. So I, I do use the word dyslexia a lot here because it's a nice shorthand. I don't think that there's a qualitative way to say who is and is not dyslexic. And often we'll talk about reading disability as simply kids who meet a certain criterion for poor reading as a better moniker to this. The other thing though is by looking at the breadth of ability from the worst readers to the best readers and looking at what correlates with that entire breadth of ability, I think you can get a lot more statistical power and a lot better insights into what's going on in those poor readers than if you try to isolate that small group of poor readers where you lose a lot of statistical power and you end up throwing out data from another 30 kids who are also very instructive. It turns out that the things that matter for varying between uh, a kid who is between one standard deviation below the mean and right at the mean. That variance is just as interesting as kids who are below one standard deviation below the mean. So there's all kinds of variance that's important and instructive to understanding how we link brain to behavior. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, 14, sorry, 14 of 58. Yeah. It was not a random sample. So just to be clear, right? Uh, several of them were recruited as part of a bigger training so step. Beforehand yeah. They, oh, okay. We knew that 12 of them ahead of time. Oh, okay. And I say about 14 because a few more were just for readers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So this was not a ran this was not a random sample. Uh, usefully though, the kids who were referred to the study were all part of a community dwelling study that looks at different kinds of behavioral profiles having nothing to do with educational attainment. So it meant that a lot of those kids actually have other kinds of problems, other kinds of academic problems just by pure coincidence. If we look at the reading network, that is, if we took at all these different parts of the brain that we know are engaged in reading, so I filled those in with dots, and they all have confusing names like left inferior frontal, frontal gyrus and superior supermarginal gyrus and so on, um, or supplementary motor area, we can look at the connectivity amounts um, around them, right? So how much does the uh, how much do the fluctuations in brain activity correlate with each other? on this graph. So this is an undirected graph, which means that I'm only showing one side of it because the mirror image is identical on the other side of it. And it's simply the correlation amongst how active these, how the activation patterns in each of these regions correlates with activation patterns in other brain regions. Generally, if we look at the cortical reading network, we see lots of intercorrelations of activity. In the subcortical regions that we care about, which is the left and right thalamus, we only see that they tend to correlate with each other. In the bigger sample, we don't see correlations with other cortical brain regions. Not a big surprise because the thalamus is part of a different brain network from the reading network. But as you'll see on the next slide, including thalamus turned out to be really useful to our analyses based on some earlier studies looking at the thalamus in reading. It does seem to really matter. It's this uh, brain, it's very deep in the brain. It's a very fundamental subcortical structure that has to do with timing and um, automatization of ability. And when you look at kids' reading ability and correlate that now with that correlation graph that I showed earlier, a very different picture emerges. So now this is more like a regression model where you look at the correlation amongst these brain regions and how that level of correlation is being modulated by individual differences in reading ability. And we look, when we look at nonword reading, what we find is two important findings. One is that cortical regions having to do with phonological processing here and super, um, supplemental motor area, inferior parietal sulcus, and inferior frontal gy or, uh, fusiform gyrus having to do with visual word recognition, those all tend to hang together such that core, the uh, connectivity of those regions is smaller in the kids who are poorer at non-word reading. 
and also that thalamus really matters for all these things. That the level of connectivity between thalamus and these cortical regions, in particular is IFG, precedural gyrus, uh, STG, uh, supplement, supplementary motor, supple, oh, I can't say it, supplementary motor area and fusiform gyrus. Thalamus, especially left thalamus, seems to really matter in that case. So one way to differentiate between these kids is not the sheer level of activation in these regions, but rather the connectivity of these regions when it comes to brain function, even just spontaneous brain function. So these kids aren't reading while they're doing this, right? They might be thinking about reading, maybe, but generally they're just lying there probably thinking about how bored they are. Uh, importantly, that's not a generic measure of who's going to be a good reader or a poor reader. If you look at passage comprehension, which is also a perfectly valid reading test, what we find is a completely different picture. The only connectivity that matters there is this IFG in the left hemisphere with precentral gyrus. So these frontal regions that are admittedly part of a more semantic reading for meaning network, that correlation does seem to, does seem to itself then predict passage comprehension ability that's being measured outside the scanner. Finally, we ran a bunch of math tests. Here's a sample. Math fluency uh, shows us a nice correlation with parts of the brain region that actually happen to coincide with uh, uh, both the reading network and the math network, which is a separate network of brain regions. So there's a different relationship there. So again, kids vary on all these different tasks in different ways, and their brain connectivity patterns also vary in principled, interesting ways that are not necessarily the same relationships, right? That different sets of connectivity patterns are going to allow us to see differences in these different groups. So in the bigger picture, this resting state study was useful because uh, it allows us to look in a task-free way at what kids are doing and how uh, different subskills of reading ability that we can assess outside the scanner are going to map to different connectivity patterns inside the brain without having to resort to specific kinds of fMRI tasks. Uh, it's not just a proxy of IQ, or it's not just a proxy of math achievement. Looking ahead, this is part of a multi-year study that's in collaboration with the TVD, uh, TVDSB, 10th Valley District School Board, and with Empower Reading, which is out of SickKids, which is a reading remediation approach which involves both phonics and comprehension remediation. So the kids with reading problems in this study are also enrolled in Empower Reading, and we've obtained follow-up scans from them. And we're doing that over the course of three years with different waves of kids to get a larger sample. And the idea there is uh, ultimately what we want to see is after one year of scanning, what kind of brain changes do we see in response to having received this remediation? The other thing that I think is really interesting is can we predict improvement based on that first scan? Do we even need to run the second scan, right? Ultimately, what we want to know with remediation is who's going to get better and who isn't. Uh, who needs, you know, 60 hours of remediation and who needs 360 hours of remediation? So what we're really interested in here is whether there's any additional information that you could get from neuroimaging that might allow you to make that determination. So these kids presumably all start in the same place. They're all poor readers in September of their, say, their grade five year. But are some of them going to improve in their reading abilities better than others as a result of getting Empower Reading? And can we use the neuroimaging data at all to make this guess? Or is it really much more complicated than that? Uh, I'm going to skip ahead now towards the end. I have some other data from EEG that I'm not going to bug people with because uh, I'm out of time. Uh, I do want to say that the alphabet does pay off, though, and that it's important to learn to use phonology to read, as I tried to emphasize before, but that actually it's a multifactorial thing. Uh, so to summarize, um, reading, as I said, is going to build on both phonology and whole word processes. To say that it's only phonology is a misnomer, right? It's that phonology is foundational to learning to read and probably lies at, at the base of most cases of reading impairments in kids. Uh, these are graded in interactive processes, though. It's not an all or none situation where you're either a phonics reader or a whole word reader, right? You're always doing a trade off between these two things. And in fact, different parts of the brain are doing different things uh, as you're reading. Um, dyslexia is interesting because it gives us a window into what happens at the bottom end of the distribution. I think, though, that when we look at ability like that, we don't want to dichotomize it as kids with dyslexia versus everybody else, but rather look at it, look at it distributionally to understand how all kids vary in probably a fairly linear way. Um, we're interested in mapping these 
brain differences to different kinds of patterns of behavior, and likewise also looking at brain connectivity rather than just saying, this is the part of the brain that differs in these kids. Uh, we've been doing that. This is part of the brain is important for a long time in cognitive neuroscience, and it's not really paying off very well, right? Because every study has a different behavioral task that shows that a different part of the brain is different in these kids with dyslexia versus kids who aren't, uh, who don't have dyslexia. Probably the story is going to be much more nuanced and has a lot more to do with connectivity and is not so task bound as we're saying it is. All right, so I thank you very much for your attention and for your time. I want to thank Suzanne Welcome, who's at University of Missouri now, uh, who is the collaborator on most of these studies. Uh, Alex Cross here, who's uh, currently a PhD in health sciences, who's working with me on the current study within power reading. Uh, Randy Newman and Amy DeRoche helped me develop some of these earlier studies of dyslexia, some of which I talked about today. Uh, Western Brain Scan, which is uh, the CFREF fund, is uh, funding this new phase where we're looking at kids with reading disability and tracking them over time with fMRI and behavioral tests, and these other uh, nice granting councils that help support all this work. So thanks very much. Um, so we have time for questions. Excellent. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the, the phonology refers to knowing the sounds of, of something. Do you have to go from, from the letters to the sound to the meaning? Or can you go directly from the letters to the meaning? I think, yes, you can go from letters to meaning directly as well. And I think that uh, the way that people have expressed it in terms of models of reading that think about it as a triangle of sounds and letters and meaning, where all those vertices of the triangle are connected, yeah. is probably the best way to think about it. That you can get crosstalk and interplay at every level. Mm -hmm. And that that's part of why it's so complicated to test it behaviorally and to say, oh, it's all phonology or it's all whole languages. Everything's connected. There was a time when the notion of speed reading was really mm -hmm. popular. I never did anything formal to learn how to do it, but my understanding was that that involved letters to meaning mm -hmm. without pronouncing. And I, I don't know how to do that. Is that, is that learnable? I don't think it is. And so Keith Rayner uh, was uh, looked at this very carefully at a few different points in his career because it keeps coming back every once in a while as, you know, learn how to read faster with speed reading and all, you know, apps on a computer trying to get you to read faster by showing you each word one after the other like a machine gun rapid fire. It turns out the faster you push people to read, the less they comprehend the worse a reader they turn out to be. That, and you can show a very clear decline that's perfectly linear with the faster I make you read, the less you're gonna understand and the more you're gonna do things like just you know pick out the keywords from the text and guess the rest. Um, people have just a natural rate of reading and they have to just be kind of okay with it. Okay. And you know, I, I read novels, but I read them really slowly. And I guess I have just have just had to be okay with it that I'm reading novels at about half the speed that my friends on the internet seem to be reading them or something, right? You can do this now. You go on Goodreads and you can see who's begun and finished reading. And either they spend half their day reading or they're just faster readers than me. But I think that most skilled reading, there's a, there's a everybody has a ceiling for what their skilled reading speed is going to be. And so I think that's just the way it shakes out. So... I agree with what you're saying there in terms of skilled reading, but wouldn't you say where children, the second language learners, are developing, you know, their reading skills, that yeah. speed reading does have a positive effect? That speed reading does? Well, learning, learning through speed reading. So yeah, increasing fluency with words. Yeah, so I think I think I would distinguish between fluent reading and speed reading there. That there's probably a big margin between going so slow that you're overloading your attention and working memory system so that you can't remember what the word at the start of the sentence because it's taking you so long to get to the end of the sentence yeah. at the bottom end. And that's part of why comprehension is so difficult in kids with dyslexia. The idea that kids with dyslexia have a comprehension deficit probably stems from the fact that they have a single word reading deficit. And they're reading so slowly each word that they just you know, they just don't have the mechanism to hold the sentence in mind over the course of the entire sentence to grab onto it at the bottom end. 
And then you get the speed reading at the top end where people are just kind of glancing at the page and kind of guessing a few words and moving on. But that there's a nice happy medium there. That you want to get people into that happy fat part of the distribution and not worry too much about going beyond that. Yeah. So, but I think, I think that's why we say fluency is part of it is to gaining fluency involves not gaining speed reading ability, but simply gaining the ability to read rapidly and efficiently. When you talk about the triangular relationship between phonology, semantics, and, and visual processing, yeah, um, developmentally, mm -hmm. um, do you see shifts in that triangle over time? Uh, like, like I think particularly, it sounded like from your research that that more triangular kind of relationship is characteristic of more skilled readers. Yeah, would it be true early readers that that the phonology uh, kind of phonology first process is more dominant? Generally, yes. And I think that especially if you're looking at successful readers, that that seems to characterize it, that the ones who develop those letter to sound correspondences more rapidly are the ones who generally are the faster ones to progress to the whole model, to the whole, all the pieces. Interestingly, though, in adults, you can still see that some adults are much more, you know, what they called Phoenician readers versus Chinese readers, which is not you're reading Phoenician and Chinese, but you're an English reader who uses more phonology versus uses more semantics or more whole words, and that there is a distribution of abilities. And so we looked in adults, actually, it's, we didn't invent this, uh, and it's usually called the strain, it's a strain in Patterson and Seidenberg paper from the 90s, where you look at the amount to which people are accessing the meaning when they're just rapidly reading a word. And you can show that people more readily access the meanings in some, some people more readily access the meanings and some people don't. And so we've been looking at this in various ways and doing things like brain stimulation to uh, make it harder for those people who are really reliant on a semantic pathway to read a word semantically by attenuating their semantic pathway using low voltages passed through the scalp using something called TDCS. None of these people are poor readers. They're all excellent readers. They're all college age adults. And we don't see a relationship in the size of that effect with how good a reader they are. They just happen to be more on one side of the balance scale than the other. Uh, so it's, it's sort of an interesting thing, right? Everybody who's a skilled reader should be using all three of those but it's still possible that the trading relations are slightly different from one individual to the next, the way that some people are left-handers and some people are right-handers or, you know, that sort of thing. I, 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 it's not that some people are faster runners or slower runners. I don't think it's even a value judgment at that level. It's just some people use a little bit more of this part of their brain or a little less of that part of their brain. And that's sort of a mysterious thing. I've not really, I feel like we're still scratching the surface of that piece of the puzzle. And then I won't ask another question. <laughs> um, uh, a language, an English professor once gave a class of us a uh, little test with sentences that had homonyms in them, but the wrong homonym was yeah. put in. So mm -hmm. when the vowel breaks, instead of B O U G H, it was B O W. Mm -hmm. A whole bunch of sentences like this. And then he asked us how we, you know, what we, what we thought of them. Some people said, oh, it didn't bother them at all. Mm -hmm. And others of us were terribly irritated by it. And he said, that has to do with how you're processing. And I would think that. I think he's onto something there. Yep. I would think that um, those of us who really were irritated by it we're less committed to the phonological side. Is that correct? I think that's yeah, true. Think that's I think that's true. Okay. And I think there are a whole web host of ways to test that by giving people homophones, right. or you can give them non-words that are homophonous with real words. Right. And some people around here at Western have done a lot of this. They call them pseudo-homophones. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's uh, all kinds of ways to get at that. And I think it's exactly right. Um, it's it's the reason why reading other people writing on the internet drives me crazy. <laughs> people on the internet drive me crazy with their T-O instead of T-O-O -O for two. Mm -hmm. And other people couldn't care less. And it's it's just it just really matters for some people. And I suspect that, you know, there's a psycholinguistic experiment there that I want to run someday where I give people like internet texts full of, you know, misspellings of this. And and I feel like some people are really just gonna just go crazy and their blood pressure is gonna go up, and other people just kind of just breezes past them. No, that's okay. T O I know that's two. I don't care which two it is. Pardon me? I like to think it's well, and, and I guess I'm wondering if it is or, or even if it's that some people just don't care about smart.
you know, as long as it sounds right. I'm not sure about the emotional point, but I know that Deborah Jared's done work looking at um, very much you're talking about with the texts and looking at individual differences. And I think she used the author recognition test to, 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 to as an individual difference variable. And so people who are able to recognize more authors than by you know thinking that they're right. more literate are the ones who tend to be able to identify those error words that are coming out more so than the people who don't. Right. Yeah. So I, I we, we have a school psychology program where we're training students to be school psychologists. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they'll be doing is helping to assess and intervene with students with reading problems. <clears throat> and I noticed a number of the points that you've alluded to seem to be directly the opposite of what school psychologists have traditionally been trained to do <laughs> as with words of education. Do. Like, for example. Well, I didn't, is it because I'm doing it wrong? <laughs> you, I could be, right? No, I think you are right. I think oh, okay. Psychologists are wrong. Oh, so no. Because I've read the same science of reading that you've read, right? Yeah. I'm familiar with the same research. So, for example, you mentioned that students who are at risk for reading problems can be recognized early, right? Even at the preschool level. Mm -hmm. But school boards often don't uh, identify students with reading problems until grade four or five. You alluded to the problems with, with the discrepancy diagnosis of. Oh, yeah, don't get me started. Oh, yeah. And school boards normally still use the discrepancy model of reading disability. A couple mm -hmm. of our, I was talking with a couple of our school science students, and they alluded to the fact that they were being trained to do that right now. It's right? a policy statement. They've adopted it as a policy statement. Yeah, Don't get me started. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have and, clashed. And you alluded to the fact that uh, there's no sharp distinction between students with dyslexia yeah. and other students. Yeah. They're actually on a continuum. Uh, and in fact, school boards still make the dichotomous distinction between students with dyslexia and without. And also, I would, I mean, I make, I, this is You're getting started. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other thing that sort of hinted at, I think, in your research, and that also comes out of the intervention research on reading, is that although school boards follow the practice of not intervening with students usually, unless they've been identified with dyslexia, in fact, we find interventions uh, typically don't interact with diagnosis, so that other low-achieving readers who, who receive phonemic awareness interventions benefit from them, even if they don't meet the criteria for dyslexia. So do you think we should totally change the way we train <laughs> yes. students? <laughs> yes. And advise Absolutely. school boards to reform their practice? Listen, the school boards are, the school boards are driving the train here, right? Yeah, yeah. They're cheap, yeah. right? Yeah. It costs money to do yeah. something about it. Yeah. So, you know, if you were including a bunch of kids with low IQ in your diagnosis of a learning disability, then suddenly you've blown open the doors to kids who need services for learning disabilities versus kids who are just generally low achieving. And that costs money. Yeah. And so they don't want to hear what I'm saying. Yeah. Although it's interesting to note that psychoeducational assessments are very expensive, right? So the psychoeducational assessment that's used to deny some student services could actually be invested in providing services in a small group context for students who are in need. You know, thanks for the time. I, can I, no, I need a pen. I need, I need my talking points. No, I mean, that's exactly right. Uh, I, I really think that a lot of this is driven by what the school board accepts in terms of the hazard ratio of how much they can afford to deal with if they know about it. And you don't want to know too much about it too soon, because if you do, then you're dealing with a lot more. Even though in the long term we know that a little bit of intervention in kindergarten saves you all kinds of money in intervention in the sixth grade or incarceration in, you know, when they're in their 20s. Yeah. We yeah. also know that our prisons are full of people with learning disabilities. Yeah. So, I mean... Unfortunately, our school psychology program operates on a scientist practitioner model. So we could actually teach students how to understand these issues scientifically. Yeah. And we don't operate on a bureaucracy practitioner model where we teach students to do whatever the Board of Education wants for processing. I, I think, though, that if they went to the board and started, you know, yeah. getting rid of the discrepancy criterion, for instance, that, that they would quickly find themselves in a different board. I, I just don't think that that's what they want to hear. I don't think it's what the penny pinchers want to hear. I, I that's so some of you need to get elected to the school. <laughs> <laughs> no, because then they'll write me out of office because they'll have to raise taxes. I mean, that's it's right. So you probably need to start at the ministry level. I guess that's what it is. And they're working from there. They don't want I know there's, but I think there's a change in the attitude, uh, just in terms of kids with learning disabilities and that early intervention piece, and uh, regardless of what kind of uh, designation or yeah. what kind of indications there are when a kid is not 
seemingly coming to green for yeah. biological awareness at that stage, intervene. Regardless yes, of whether I think to be fair, um, every kid in the TBDSB gets a phonological awareness screen right mm -hmm. here right now. Yeah. for instance, right? And that's had a huge impact in terms of early identification and probably heads off a lot of the issues that you would have otherwise about waiting until they're in the fourth grade. Yeah, well, I so, I mean, I, I'm being a little uncharitable, but it's, you know, the things can be pushed well, in the right. I know, I spent 40 years in one of the boards and I've seen the change, the switch to early intervention. But yeah. you're right, there is a... a As a matter of policy, up. though, for instance, this the, the discrepancy view is is still the recited view for the college and school psychologists. Because it just doesn't know something different. Well, I think just even speaking to that, I mean, having come right fresh from the, the ground level of where that's happening, and I think there is some real um, debate if you look at, again, school boards and psychology versus the science of learning and, and the evidence coming around that. That discrepancy model doesn't hold weight when you're looking at individual differences in that response to intervention piece. And, and I guess that's where I'm really curious around uh, the empowered a specific program yeah. and the parameters that are around that and that kind of subset of children versus those perhaps in grade two and what Empower looks like at that point. And, and the way that it's being implemented at TBDSB right now is only for specific classrooms that are congregated classrooms yeah. in specific schools and there's only a handful of them. Yeah. The kids apply to get in. The parents often are the ones who subsidize it. If the kid doesn't already have an IEP, they'll subsidize the psychoeducational testing to get the breadth of identification needed to get them into that classroom. So the parents work really hard. From the recruitment standpoint, it's meant the parents are delighted to see us. They really want their kid participating in our study and are really interested in the whole thing, even though their kid has already been through a lot of testing and, you know, are as sort of, you know, the kid's been through the ringer and now they're going to a different school in a different part of the city and so on. But that's how it's being implemented at the board level right now. Uh, there are other places like I know Amethyst School, for instance, again, they've got Empower going there for the older kids because there's the reading comprehension aspect to Empower as well now. That's uh, that they're also implementing at that end of things. But again, those are kids who've been really identified very narrowly as having learning problems for that. At the board level, the there's not really a small group intervention. That's a uniform thing, right? I'm not sure what it is other than that. Maybe you understand. I think how different boards are using it. I know my, my in the Hamilton area, yeah. my, mm -hmm. yeah, it's differently in terms of kids getting pulled out of class. So I right. work with the learning support teachers on Right. I'm not saying that's not happening at TBDSB, but it's more uneven in terms of what the program is. I don't think they've completely bought into it. So I'm thinking about the applications of your research. Yeah. And so as you were talking about it, the main thing I was thinking about was, you know, looking at interventions and seeing how that changed the neural markers, uh -huh. which I think you were talking about later on with the Empower Reading research, right? Yeah. So then I'm wondering, well, why just looking at one kind of intervention rather than, you know, multiple types of it, you know, perhaps it's cost. Yeah. Um, as well as you know the intervals of, of the intervention. To me, that seems like the you know where I would want to go. The the actual uh, studies out there of different kinds of interventions as a random controlled trial, where these where the control intervention was a different kind of reading remediation rather than just a, a null control or a weightless control. Those those studies have always struggled with having enough statistical power, especially in the context of a neuroimaging study, that we're just not quite there yet. Uh, the studies that are right now going on in the U.S., there's one happening at uh, Georgia State that, again, is an Empower one, uh, is many, many dozens of kids or hundreds of kids, and it's done across the whole board. That's the way they've done it, is just looking at change over time. And it's not a random controlled trial, but part of, and, and it's certainly not testing, pitting one approach versus the other. I think it builds on the earlier work that was done in Pittsburgh where they tried to do it. And what ended up happening was they found that all of the interventions worked, and there wasn't a whole lot of difference from one to the next. So, I mean, there are lots of different interventions, yeah. but they all tend to focus on phonics these days. Mm -hmm. And I also think nobody's getting a whole language intervention, for instance, or the inter the not the null intervention would be just the additional help that a child would get from a support teacher in class. And that's really what the the null model is right now, uh, mostly because I think they probably all just work and that the degree to which one is better than the other is probably more fine-grained than we're understanding. Okay. I, I, I feel like 
a lot of progress is a lot more progress is being made by looking at the responders versus the non-responders. And once we have a better grasp of who the non-responders are, I think that's where this new model can come in where we think about, well, maybe the non-responders need a different approach. Maybe those are the ones who actually don't need phonics. Yeah. And, and then, sorry, just one, one, one sort of follow-up question to this. So when, when I think about all of this, you know, I, I think of, I guess, the fMRI is a, a more sensitive measure than you can get through, you know, one-on-one -on -one, uh, individual assessment. But, of course, it's a much more expensive uh, measure. So it, 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 is, it, is it more effective? You know, I don't think so. No. I've yet to see a single study that shows me that fMRI got you something that the behavioral tests don't. Okay, so so and, and that's that's what I was thinking. So it, it, it's really cool and everything yeah. like that, but I, I'm just wondering if there are you know benefits apart from the sorry. the coolness and I think the understanding of <laughs> absolutely and and the basic science of understanding what the neurocognitive mechanisms are, yeah. but then also the ability to loop loop back with the behavioral measures to understand how you could develop some behavioral measures that better get at the constructs that we think are happening at the neural level. I think ultimately the promise is not that we could put a child in a scanner at the age of two and everybody just lines up and everybody gets their scan mm -hmm. and we, we sort them into bins. I don't think that's ever going to happen. That's yeah. crazy talk, right? What we really want is a set of behavioral tests that replicate the things that we use the neuroimaging to come at in the first place. I think that's where we're going. And better behavioral measures that may be differentiated. You know, if I happen to find an fMRI thing that showed me, you know, 20% more kids with reading problems than I could measure with a behavioral task, my next thing would be, well, what items on the behavioral test differentiate those 20% from the other kids? And maybe that's where I would start with developing a new task instead. Yeah, so, so I, I guess the ideal application would be the develop, development of some diagnostic measure. Yeah, okay. yeah. I think that's where we want to go. Okay. And more automated measures as well, yeah. right? Not that don't require school psychologists and clinical psychologists, at least as a first pass. Right now we've got maybe a 10 to 15 minute screener that we run through all the kids in JK and SK in our schools with. And those actually identify with a pretty nice level of sensitivity which kids we should refer to further investigation. Uh, and it's very quick to go. And, and all these kids who want extra hours because they need their volunteer hours to become speech pathologists um, volunteer in our study and then we send them to schools and they do they just blast through school really quickly with this. And we're trying to convince the board that you know this is a sensitive instrument that you could give to all kids. But ultimately what we really need is if it all fit on an iPad and they could just log in from home and do it, you know, yeah. speak into the microphone and read those words and some some machine learning algorithm could sort them as this kid needs another look, this kid is fine. And I think that's that direction I think is ultimately going to be a lot more on the ground, changey than the fMRI stuff, which I think is still just getting at the other piece, which is what's going on in your brain when you read? Somebody else had a question. Oh. Or just quickly, Mark, just uh, thinking a little bit I about keep, those yeah. kind of non-responders. Yeah. So that was my question. Oh, was yes, I have to go ahead and ask it. Well, it's just, just, uh, we've had some um, just families through the, the clinic in particular where they had kind of a heavy dose of kind of that phonics and yeah. kind of decoding route and yeah. seemed to not be responding the, in the same way as certainly kind of other struggling readers. Yeah. That way. And just uh, curious about kind of those neurocognitive pathways or you know, certainly there's some discussion around other kind of multi-sensory approaches mm -hmm. or other kind of... I'm just curious if there's kind of suggestions around, you know, yeah. kind of the Orton Gillingham or other types of kind of compensatory kind of pathways. And even Orton Gillingham is, is phonological in nature, That's but true. just using multisensory approaches to get at it, right? Thinking about letters and sounds visually as well as tactile and so on. Yeah. Uh, I wonder though, there's the other piece of it is is the concept of surface dyslexia, where some kids are just really only decoding and never do that other thing, never do that whole language approach, and that that's what's slowing them down. There's some evidence that there's a chunk of kids out there that look like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the first piece of it. The other is uh, there's the idea that there's this rapid automatization to reading, and that you can see that also in something as simple as color naming, where you show them color chips and they name the colors as quickly as possible. Some kids bomb on that task, which is ridiculous. It's naming the same four colors over and over again, and they're terrible at it, and it correlates with reading at a huge level. And they're not colorblind. We checked. Uh, it's it's really that the rapid automatization of seeing something and moving your eye to the next thing and saying the name of that and forgetting it and moving on to the next thing is really hard for some kids. And that's clearly a piece of reading that's not phonological in nature. And that's been sort of underreported, but people talk about a RAND deficit as a yeah. rapid automatized naming deficit that I think may just 
feed into a different kind of child. Uh, people doing similar neuroimaging stuff to my own who've looked at the RAN network versus the phonological awareness network find two different brain networks supporting those two different abilities in poor readers. Um, so that's uh, work out of Tufts University in Northwestern, really nice work by uh, uh, people like Elizabeth Norton and Marianne Wolf. So it's clear that there's stuff going on there. That is, and, and so when I, you know, there's probably more than one kind of dyslexic. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately right now when I talk about phonics, I'm probably only helping a chunk of them, but not all of them. or missing some aspect of it, if it's multifactorial. You remind me of about 35 years ago, working with kids with severe learning disabilities, and we put them through the exercises where they would look at paragraphs full of letters and they track yeah. and try to improve their tracking rate. And to be honest with you, used in conjunction with a lot of other interventions, that really helped a lot of kids progress. That with their problem. reading? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. But along with decoding phonological awareness, yeah. it was a real multi-sensory approach. But right. I haven't seen that widening. No, me either. It's yeah. For years and years, but I used it. Do you think in terms of um, the study that's still ongoing with responders versus non responders, do you have predictions about what their network currently looks like in terms of how you would tease apart those two and how would that differ based on their um, behavioral scores as well in terms of trying to predict who's going to respond versus not? Uh, so, yet? yeah, not from our group. Jeff Malins, who's working with Haskins Labs, he used to be here at Western, and he's, uh, he's done some analyses of the kids from the Georgia State cohort where they've tried to look at this. And the one thing that he found in common with the non-responders was they were absolutely the worst readers. That they were actually, you could tell behaviorally even before you started the intervention, mm -hmm. that those would be the kids not to respond, were the ones who were really <coughs> down at the like first and second percentile. And that, at least in their cohort so far, behaviorally that was the prediction. From the brain imaging predictions, those data are still out. We're, ours, we've got a small chunk of data right now that we could look at, but probably too small to make too many conclusions about. Uh, I think that group is probably looking that at that now, and they probably they probably have an answer, but haven't presented it yet. Uh, I suspect that'll be coming out soon, and they'll probably beat us to it. They're a few years ahead of us. They have, they have NIH funding, so they have like one more, one figure more. They're in the millions rather than hundred thousand dollar funding. So it's. But it's also interesting to think about you know, specifics about the power and the different components of it. Yeah. How multifaceted. Right. It's it's yeah. the shotgun approach, yeah. right? It's phonics to start, the comprehension later, and it's a two-year stream. It's everything that can go wrong. So it's hard to know which of those is going to matter. And it's not particularly targeted, is my understanding, in the sense that everybody just does. You could give it to the whole lessons. classroom if you want, yeah. right? High achieving, low achieving, everybody everybody does it. I have one more I'd like. To, I, I'm intrigued by your comment at the beginning about us uh, human beings not being it not evolved to read. Yeah. Has, has anybody actually looked at that in terms of human evolution? Uh, because very early on, early human beings certainly put uh, symbols on the walls of caves and things like mm -hmm. that, and that has to have something. It does in an interesting way that symbols that symbols that you see in the earliest hominids and pre-hominids as well that those those were um, pictographic, that is they were direct representations of the things that they were signifying. So when you had a moose, it really was a picture of a moose, and that the switch that happened to um, to logographic scripts where you have a picture that doesn't depict exactly the thing that it means, that that switch probably only happened about 5,000 years ago. And anything before then was purely um, ideographic or uh, pictographic depictions of the thing that it's depicting. So going from, uh, so the ability to write out a concept that you could not easily image or draw out on the side of a wall. Uh, so languages like, um, are there pictographic languages, Chinese and, and, and Japanese? Yes, but no, they're not pictographic, they're logographic, logographic. where the, the thing that they signify doesn't look like the symbol, with few exceptions, which allows them the flexibility of depicting things in an arbitrary fashion. So concepts like religion or freedom uh, or beauty, there's no single image that you could depict with that. 
but we can still depict it with language because we have a, an arbitrary relationship between the sign and the meaning. And so that level of semiotics is the thing that is only very recently arrived to humans. Like 5,000 years. Like 5,000 years, like, like, you know, in a few different places around the time that agriculture happened. And that is where we see the birth of that shift. And so even um, uh, hieroglyphics, for instance, look like little pictograms, right? These little birds and eyes and so on. But in fact, it's, it's, that's a phonetic alphabet. What it is is it's the little bird, except this first, say, first phoneme in whatever the word for bird was, or eagle, is the phoneme that's depicted by that symbol. So they adopted a pictographic representation, turned it actually into an alphabetic or syllabic representation. And then it becomes, but then it's the freedom of expression explodes. Then you're telling stories, right? And you can tell the exact story that you want the person to hear versus, you know, here's a picture of a moose I just hunted, which is a slightly different thing that we see when we look at uh, cave drawings and drawings on, on, on uh, stones and so on. It's great stuff. So the argument is that there's not been enough of a genetic change in humans in the last, say, 10,000 years to explain literacy. And instead what it is is that literacy kind of shoehorns itself in on whatever's there already. Things like speech, motor control, attention, oculomotor control, articulation. All these things that we do when we're reading are being kind of reconfigured in the brain. And so if you look at literate brains versus illiterate brains, what you see is that when literacy emerges, you see a reconfiguration in other parts of the brain having to do with face recognition. People who are illiterate use their more their left hemisphere to recognize faces. As soon as you start reading, all that stuff gets moved into the right hemisphere because you have to make room for that visual language representation. It's good stuff. So if you're interested in this stuff, uh, Stanislas Dehan's book about the reading brain is a really excellent source for this. Uh, and Mark Seidenberg's book about just the psycholinguistics of learning to read called Language at the Speed of Sight is also extremely good. Uh, and I think if you read both of those books, you would just be over the moon excited. It's really because it takes the basic science and actually says, like, this is what it means. The Han stuff is, you know, what does it mean to be human? Here's what reading tells us. Seidenberg is, how do you teach kids how to read? You know, you should listen to these psycholinguists instead of listening to politicians. <laughs> well, thank you, Mark. That thank you. Really interesting talk. As you can see, it generated a lot of questions. It's really nice to hear, too. Yeah, well, thanks very much. <laughs>